Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where yesterday Deadpool fans had a great day. Fox and FXX, their secondary FX channel, had a great day. And Donald Glover and his brother Stephen had a great day. But Ryan Reynolds, maybe not so much. And maybe also to some degree, Disney. But allow me to explain. So the announcement yesterday was that FXX has greenlit Donald Glover and his brother Steven's pitch to do a Deadpool animated series. Again, on FXX, while on the main FX channel, Donald Glover and his brother Steven are, of course, behind the hit show, the award-winning show, Atlanta. And they seem to be doing very well over at Fox because, of course, Zazie Beetz, who also stars on Atlanta, was just recently cast as Domino in the upcoming Deadpool movie. So Fox sees... A real boon there. And also, it will be interesting, speaking of uh, black talent, they have the upcoming show uh, Snowfall about how crack began uh, in the United States, and they've been running ads very heavily for that, and that looks pretty compelling. The lead there, I think, has a lot of charisma. I wouldn't be surprised if someone snaps him up pretty fast if he can act. But anyway, we're talking about Atlanta uh, TV. Uh, it used to be, as I said before, if you were a TV actor, it was very hard to, to do the jump to movies. But cable is so high quality and streaming is so high quality that it's becoming a way for new talent to get recognized. It's almost become a shortcut in some ways. Very exciting. But anyway, first of all, let's talk about Disney. Now, Disney's invested a lot of money in Donald Glover as well. And it's unusual to see talent you know, have two homes, so to speak, right? So his ties at Fox are deepening, but he's also in the upcoming Spider-Man Homecoming movie. He's in the Han Solo film as Lando Calrissian. And of course, he's voicing Simba in the live action, well, CGI animated, The Lion King. That's a big deal. Uh, you know, you might feel, well, it's a small role in Spider-Man Homecoming and it's just voiceover work in The Lion King. But being the new Lando Calrissian is, 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 a, is a sweet gig. But still, Donald Glover is like, hey, you know, and I don't know. I think Donald Glover right now has enough clout to, to have two homes. Uh, so, you know, for instance, um, when you have a lot of new talent coming about, uh, Jordan Peele, uh, his home is universal. He's settled in. That's where he's going to work. Uh, you know, you have like Johnny Depp loves Disney and works primarily there. So y you can see that talent does have a home. So it's unusual what Donald Glover is doing. But also what's interesting here is that Fox is very heavily investing in the Deadpool brand. Not only do they have the movies, but now they're going to have an animated series. That's a bold move. And so you should expect even other, other uh, things to come about as they try and make this a real cash cow for themselves. But um, also, speaking of FXX, Archer, uh, a very popular animated series on FX, has moved to that sub-network. So uh, they're maybe trying to make a play for the Cartoon Network's Adult Swim audience. And maybe, I think that's pretty smart. I don't think any FXX live action shows have really hit the spot. So to rebrand it maybe as a place for really quality adult cartoons, animation, could work very well. I haven't watched the new Archer where he's like, um, uh, like a film noir Archer. If any of you are watching it, is it still good? Uh, largely because I don't want to find out where FXX is. But I think with uh, Deadpool sweetening the pot, perhaps I will search search for the channel on my uh, Verizon Fios package. But anyway, what was really surprising to me is that Ryan Reynolds was not mentioned as involved in the project in any way, from doing the voice of the character Deadpool to being part of the behind-the-scenes team. And I tweeted that that was, you know, a pretty bad uh, situation for Ryan Reynolds. And one of you said back, hey, Deadpool was around before Ryan Reynolds and will be around long after Ryan Reynolds. Uh, but I think Ryan Reynolds would disagree uh, and would certainly, you know, that would not be in Ryan Reynolds' best interest. So allow me, allow me to further elaborate. So Ryan Reynolds has been closely aligned with the character of Deadpool since 2009. Even before that, because he was the ideal casting choice for many fans. And then, of course, Hugh Jackman, who was producing X-Men Origins Wolverine, cast him in the role. And then made a horrific mess out of it. But so for over, pretty much, I'd say for almost a decade now, Ryan Reynolds has been associated with the character of Deadpool. Now, when the movie came about, you know, and he willed it. He's the one who leaked the footage to get it greenlit by Fox. He's the one who, you know, steered that ad campaign. He's the one who decided to get rid of Tim Miller for the sequel. Ryan Reynolds and Deadpool, I think from his perspective, are one in the same. 
and he has nothing else. He cannot have a hit movie outside of Deadpool, which I think is also very alarming. So the idea that he would not be in control of the character, that things would be happening with that character, and that character could experience success without his participation, I think would be very scary. I would, I, th this is happening no matter what, this uh, Deadpool animated series. So if I were Ryan Reynolds, I don't want to share or, you know, have a joint custody of the character with Donald Glover. I would be working very hard to weasel my way in there, right? Certainly to do the voice. I mean, you can't. And what if someone else does a great job voicing Deadpool and people are like, oh, well, if Ryan Reynolds wants too much money or, you know, God forbid Deadpool 2 isn't up to the standards that everybody wants, they might be like, oh, well, we could just get rid of him. How about this voice actor guy? He does a great job. It proves that someone else can play Deadpool. Ryan Reynolds does not want that to be a discussion. He wants to be like, only I can play Deadpool. So, you know, even in voiceover work. So this is not good stuff. So we'll see how it develops. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see a Ryan, an announcement that Ryan Reynolds is, is going to become heavily involved in this soon. If you don't see it, that's really bad news for Ryan Reynolds and his team. All right, so uh, speaking of television, it was a big TV uh, news day yesterday. Judge Dredd has found life on the small screen, and I think it sounds pretty darn promising. So I Am Global, uh, their television division, is going to develop this show. It doesn't have a home yet, but I think if it continues along this path, it could get a pretty darn good home. We'll talk about that, but first off, uh, I Am Global, so their television division will be developing the Judge Dredd TV show, which will be called Judge Dredd Mega City One. You can see the poster uh, image here. I think it sounds fantastic. Uh, and it, I Am Global television is currently being run by sci former sci head of sci-fi Mark Stern, who is taking credit for Battlestar Galactica, etc. So like all the shows that were during his run, he's like, this guy did it, all right? And it's like, well, maybe he did. I mean, I, I think that you should take that with a grain of salt because, of course, I think the showrunners were obviously very important to the success of the shows. Now, that's not to say that Mark Stern wasn't crucial in, you know, having faith in his showrunners, picking good showrunners, knowing what makes a good show. He could have totally done that. But we'll, you know, we'll have to see. I mean, I Am Global must have, you would say I Am Global must have hired him for a reason, but they might have just been like, ah, oh, you did a great job not getting anyone's way over at sci-fi. You know, I mean, you don't know how much Mark Stern actually contributed to sci-fi's solid success. Battlestar Galactica, obviously, the, being the biggest hit that he's had. Uh, but if this can come anywhere close to that, that would be huge. So anyway, I would think that maybe they could get Carl Urban to come back. That's what, that would be my main goal next if I were Mark Stern and I Am Global. I'd be like, I'd be sending him the biggest fruit basket in the world. I'd be like, what's it going to take, Carl? Because he's in Guardians, I mean, he's in <laughs> Thor Ragnarok, which looks like Guardians of the Galaxy, but he's in Thor Ragnarok, but he has a small role. I mean, he rated one shot in the trailer, right? He's not busy. Uh, also, he's already done television. He was an Almost Human on Fox with Michael Ely, which, by the way, was a fabulous, fabulous show. It's too bad it didn't last. So he's done TV before, and if they can get a good enough, maybe his contract could be contingent on where it ends up. Uh, you know, he does. maybe he doesn't want to do another network show. I wouldn't blame him, but I'm sure Carl Urban would love to land on cable or streaming. So that's a, a, a big thing. That would be the next uh, box to check. He did such a, If you haven't seen Dread, watch Dread. It's such a fabulous film. Uh, you know, sure, it's very heavily, you know, borrows from the raid, but it's really well done. Uh, and Carl Urban does a fantastic job as Judge Dredd, and he never takes the mask off. You know, that's that's really impressive. That's commitment there. Uh, and he manages to emote through just his jaw and mouth and voice, so that's pretty impressive. But the other reason that the movie was so good, uh, it also has Lena Headley in it uh, as the villain. So, but anyway, and also, um, ooh, oh, uh, uh, Dom Gleason. Is one of his earliest roles, Donald Gleason. So that's a fun thing to spot. But anyway, one of the reasons the movie is so good is because Alex Garland wrote the script, you know, Ex Machina. So that would be my biggest concern. Now, you know, we talked about the uh, Hellboy uh, reboot and how bad the writing team is, right? And we're like, ah, maybe they have untapped depths of talent that are going to finally be uh, uh, accessed. Uh, I mean, I hope that's what's the, what the case is. But after you secure your star, you need to make sure you get a really good writer for the show. That's going to be really, really tricky. And if all these stars align, literally, a star writer, hopefully, and a star, in, you know, as Judge Dredd, I think Carl Urban counts when it comes to Judge Dredd as being a star because so many people like his, liked his performance. But anyway, I think you could attract Cable 
or a streaming service to be interested in this. I would want this. I would be looking at, if I, w I was a representative for Amazon, uh, not Hulu, um, Amazon, I mean, maybe, I'm sure Hulu would love it, but I think they could do better than that. Uh, Handmaiden's Tale is a hit, but it's not that big a hit, I don't think. So uh, Netflix, Amazon, HBO, Showtime. Oh, Showtime, this would be a great, you know, they, they can really use this kind of diversification for their portfolio. They don't have anything comic booky too much over there. Uh, like for instance, American Gods is on Stars, and they just haven't really been able to launch that appropriately. It's, it's too bad, like no one's talking about it. They had a good press. Also, I think the show is a little inaccessible, which is one of the reasons it hasn't done particularly well. But anyway, what I wanted to say is that with Judge Dredd, do you know who I would, you know who I think should go after this? Apple. Apple is moving into original content very slowly. I think they're going to start out with like reality television and like documentary type stuff. But I think that I would want Judge Dredd. I, I would be like, let me see how this comes together. I might want it. So we'll see how this, how this progresses. It could turn out really poorly, but it could also turn out amazing. And watch Dredd. Very good movie. All right, so speaking of actors who work, and you know, are in it for the long haul, so sometimes acting is a marathon, not a sprint. And uh, Walton Goggins has been running for a long time. Everybody has their own When I Fell in Love with Walton Goggins story. Mine's unjustified. He was just so good as Boyd Crowder. Absolutely love him. I mean, it was really a large part his chemistry with uh, Timothy Oliphant. But I, I've loved him uh, ever since, and I think that him joining Quentin Tarantino's team has been absolutely fabulous. I loved him in The Hateful Eight. And he seems to have a little Tarantino juice to him now. Now that Tarantino has blessed him, other movies seem interested in him. So I think it's partially, Tarantino, partially Walton Goggins doing such good work over such a long period of time, partially the Tarantino blessing, and then also he has a good management team who's able to capitalize on those, uh, that, that situation that he finds himself in. So he signed a new deal yesterday, and that's to be in the third Maze Runner film, The Death Cure, which is going to start filming with um, uh, Dylan O'Brien, who of course had a horrific accident while filming the, um, I think, uh, while starting to film the third film. And it was so bad that he had to be hospitalized, it had to be put on hold, and, and then he, he went and he made American Assassin, and now he's coming back to make this third film. I don't know if I would have come back and made it, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't think that the films have had a strong enough return to warrant this, but let's see. So anyway, um, I don't know if anything's going to come of this. I don't know, for Walton Goggins, this might just be another, collect those paychecks, Walton, keep working. We talked the other day about an actor needs to act, so uh, with uh, Daphne Keene. So Walton Goggins needs to feel like he has momentum and he needs his agents need to be like, he's hot, everybody wants him. So he just wrapped uh, Tomb Raider, where he's the villain, so I think that's his best gig currently. And he's also on History Channel's television show, original television show about the Navy SEALs 6. Uh, that's... I think, you know, more of the same for him. He's already a very experienced television actor. The goal here, obviously, is not to, to move into film. Uh, and also, I'm sure he's like, are you writing anything, Tarantino? Put me in it. And I'm sure he will. Tarantino, once he likes an actor and discovers him, and I think he and uh, Goggins are getting along quite well, and Goggins is such a good fit with Tarantino's writing style, which everybody apparently said to Tarantino, and that's why he hired him. Uh, but I'm sure he'll use him again for his next project. So anyway, I think it's great news for Walton Goggins from like a business perspective, but I don't really know if I have any faith in the project itself. So I'm curious, what do you think? Does it make you more interested to watch the, the third Maze Runner because Walton Goggins is in it? Or are you just happy for Walton Goggins and you're like, see you on the other side, Walton? And also, uh, how do you think his career is progressing? Now, I have a really great viewer question today from Star Hewley. And Star Hewley put a lot of great cute emojis in this, so that was fun. So Star said, hi, Grace. Please pick me. I have the best question ever. Ah, it is a good question. How do studios determine the amount of advertising a movie should receive? Well, Star is really talking about merchandising. Okay, so for example, Star Wars The Force Awakens and Batman v Superman have commercials, toys, clothing, cereal, interviews with the cast, and a strong online presence. But a movie like Wonder Woman isn't receiving the same care respectively. With the current political climate towards women, I would think that Warner Brothers would want to capitalize on this. What are your thoughts? By the way, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and I've been listening to you on my way to work for five years now. Ah, oh, that means so much. I love what you do and continue to keep up the good work. Well, I hope you're having a good drive to work, Star, um, and I, or, or however you're getting to work. Thanks for uh, allowing me to keep you company and, a, and great question. All right, so let me explain. So Hollywood is not a big risk-taking uh, industry, as you've sh you might have noticed by now, right? They like to have things, they like to have a track record, they like to have something else vouch for something. They're not really going to leap. 
So they like to know that something's going to do well before they spend a lot of money on commercials, uh, on toys, clothing, and cereal deals, etc. So with Star Wars, for instance, Star Wars has a long history of selling merchandise. So there's always going to be a lot of Star Wars merchandise generated. I mean, that's the Star Wars was the first big merchandising deal. Star Wars was the first one to such a degree that Fox was like, uh, you can have the merchandising rights, George Lucas. Sure. Ha ha. He's so stupid. Oh my God. Look how much money it's worth. It's worth so much money that George Lucas was able to build industrial light and magic with the, re with the, with the re financial returns. So Star Wars was the first and it continues to be, I think, one of the few consistent juggernauts when it comes to merchandising, right? I mean, as the world gets more digital, people buy less and less physical products. Uh, but Batman's always been a strong seller and Superman as well. Uh, you know, I don't think to the degree of Batman, but people like Superman. So that's why you see a lot of uh, push for those things in, in, the, in the merchandising space because people just want that stuff anyway. But with Wonder Woman, you might recall that Black Widow has had a similar problem and that everyone's like, where's the Black Widow merchandise? And the problem is, is that historically, female action figures, for instance, and female characters in male-centric merchandise uh, don't sell well. And you might be like, why is there male-centric and female-centric merchandise in the first place? Well, while it's an unfortunate fact of life, so far that's just the way, the way that things go. You know, uh, it's unfortunately, in I mean, there are a couple of people who cross over, but for the most part, when you're talking the large numbers that you need for, for the financial returns that make it worth an investment, people still have very gender-specific purchase, purchases that they make. So it's just a fact of life. So you are seeing, I think, a pretty strong push for Wonder Woman toys like in Walmart, but they're very female-centric toys. They're like Barbie doll type characters. Really not anything, when I think this is a mistake, that would maybe inspire a guy to pick it up, right? I mean, they seem to be very directed at female purchasers. But yet they don't seem totally female-friendly to me either, so I would, be, I would be curious to see if they're selling at all, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, so... What the, I think they're going to test the waters and see if stuff sells, and if it does sell, then they'll make more, right? Like if Wonder Woman's a huge hit, they'll be like, okay, let's they'll they'll decide to do some more stuff. I think there are a couple of deals. Like I think Wonder Woman, I saw a headline that she was being sold like on diet soda, and people were like, that's offensive, and it's like I don't know. I think women do buy diet soda, so I don't see any problem with that, quite frankly. Uh, and I think that you know the Warner Brothers PR team has said, oh well, we're modeling it after our Supergirl, uh, you know. Uh, business model for advertising and that's like why super I mean Supergirl is losing viewers like you wouldn't believe <laughs> why would you model anything off of that it's so stupid uh, you know I just feel I would just be like I'm just gonna barf Wonder Woman all over the entire world and ho and see if it works because I think this is it's a new space that's being forged so I think that you kind of have to rewrite the rules a little bit but anyway I think the mistake they're making personally your your question really made me think about this star is that instead of focusing on dolls, uh, I would focus on low price point items to really try and just get Wonder Woman in people's lives, right? I would do like impulse purchase items. So you're at the checkout and you're like, oh, maybe I'll get this Wonder Woman pen or pack of stickers or a notebook or a backpack or a phone cover, right? Uh, like it's a, it's a very small commitment financially, you know, and it's like something you're like, you know what, I don't want like a Wonder Woman doll, you know, because I think people play less and less with that stuff. Um, and I don't know, I think collecting is it also gone down, I think to some degree, but everyone could use a pen or an iPhone case, right, or phone case or a notebook or like a bag, right? I think that's what they should be pushing in, in terms of Wonder Woman, just to get someone to, who, so, who says, I wouldn't normally buy something for Wonder Woman, but I'm so supportive of the idea of this character and, you know, you know, Gal Gadot in the role and I want to see it do well, but I'm going to support it, like a pin, stuff like that. And I think that that's really what they should be doing. I think that um, asking someone to buy a giant, and it's a very large size Wonder Woman doll, is I think a little bit of a, of, of, a, a too big an ask. So I'm curious, what do you think, uh, both of, you know, the realities of the merchandising business? And also, what do you think of the Wonder Woman merchandising so far? Do you think that, do you think it's going well? And also, what would you do differently? I honestly, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if any of you got this, but Warner Brothers sent out an invite to asking people to join their like A-list community to ask for advice. 
And uh, I think I, I have mixed feelings about it, uh, but I think it's it's funny that they're like, you know, they're like, basically they're like, give us feedback for free, you know, like, oh, you get like fan access. And it's like, you're asking people to, you know, I hope it's just like um, a, a, a group, you know, to, to ask, you know, that's something they do in advertising all the time that they, they don't pay for, but I hope they don't ask too much of those people and take advantage of them. And also, I think these are very obvious things to some degree. I think that anyone on the street would, you know, I mean, like um, when the Disney store was very popular and they're coming back a little bit, but like the low price point on it, item, well, actually, you know what? A good example is Tiffany's, just really fast. Tiffany's, I'll tell you this, Tiffany's is a store that's very smart and Tiffany's makes it so that if you walk into the store, you can walk out having purchased something, even if it's just a Tiffany's pen or a notebook or one of their more expensive items. And I think that's something the Disney store did to some degree. Um, just making sure that you can walk out with some item. And I think that there isn't enough variety of items to make sure that everybody can buy something with Wonder Woman on it. I just don't see that. So that's my thoughts. Thank you for your question, Star. Fabulous question. Have a great time at work. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please write down below anything in today's top three stories, Star's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.